Okay, so dear colleagues, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we have a seminar by Professor Alexander Koloba from Herzen University. Uh, so uh, Alexander is the author of one of uh, quite a few prominent works in the field of uh, childhood genides, uh, including those based on phase change, well, uh, including childhood genides as a part of phase change materials, which can exchange the phase state between amorphous and crystalline and uh, have uh, fascinating properties, which will be also a part of this talk, and also two-dimensional uh, digital cogenites, which will also be a part of this talk. So uh, we have uh, an hour for our seminar. Do you prefer to uh, for questions during the talk or after? Sure. Okay, so I suggest uh, you can ask the questions during the talk, uh, write in the chat, and I will uh, stop and uh, let you ask your question. So let's start. Okay, the harmonics, so I will talk about functional chalcogenate semiconductors as the application of the electronic and photonics. And I will talk about both experimental and computational aspects of these materials. So when we speak about semiconductors these days, so usually people mean either silicon or 3.5 semiconductors. Okay, so what are these funny chalcogenates? So chalcogenates are materials that contain uh, chalcogen, which is a group six element such as sulfur, selenium, or tellurium. And actually chalcogenate played a very important role in the history of semiconductors, as well as they're now playing in semiconductor science and technology. So first of all, I will say a few words about history of semiconductors, the role of chalcogenates. And I will speak about four classes of chalcogenate materials, such as chalcogenate glasses, phase change materials, topological insulators, and two digital cogenites. Okay, history. So the first semiconductor effect, which is the characteristic temperature dependence of conductivity, was observed by Faraday in 1833 using silver sulfide. Then photoconductivity, which is another attribute of semiconducting materials, was observed by Smith again on selenium, chalcogenite. Rectification effect was discovered on lead sulfide. Photovoltaic effect was discovered using selenium. Selenium was also used in the Bell's first photo de detector. Again, rectifiers, lead selenide. Field effect semiconductor device concept was patented for a chalcogenide materials. So you see for like, 50 years, chalcogenates was the only semiconductor material studied. And it was also only with the discovery of a transistor with the PN junction that selenium, silicon became an important material. And for the discovery of transistor, Bardi Shockley and Brad Tame got a Nobel Prize. And actually, Bardin got two Nobel Prizes. As you may know, he's the only person who obtained two Nobel Prizes in the same field of science. It's formally not allowed to give two prizes to, to the same person. But his both discoveries results were so impressive that for him, an exception was made. Okay, and then silicon has an indirect band gap, so optical transitions are very inefficient. So for optical devices, optoelectronic devices like lasers, three five materials are important and here, a great contribution by Verasol Fiorov, Nobel Prize in Physics was made. He got the Nobel Prize for his contribution to the semiconducting lasers. And it's my pleasure to show his picture because he was my teacher. And then in, in the 50s, again, chalcogenase came back to the play field. And they came back with the discovery of Bacolamides and Garinova of semiconducting property of some chalcogenate glasses. It was very unusual because traditionally it's considered that the semiconducting gap is a result of periodicity in the material. In most textbooks, it's treated from the periodicity. So how could a glass have a gap back? So it was a mystery. And in 1977, Mott receives the Nobel Prize for his theoretical work on amorphous semiconductors. And he is actually saying exactly the thing that the gap is a sophisticated concept entirely dependent on quantum mechanics and the previous theory was based on the assumption that the material was crystalline. Then how could a glass be a semiconductor? 
And then a very great impetus to development of amorphous semiconductors was given by Oshinsky, who in 1968 reported switching in memory effects in amorphous chalcogenides. So here on the oscilloscope, there's an IV characteristic of a thin film of his chalcogenide material. And you see that the IV characteristic is very similar to the characteristic of the tyristor. But TIRIST is a very complicated device with two, two PN junctions. And without saying much, I will just show you the steps necessary to fabricate a TIRISTER. Okay, diffusion, doping, etching, blah, blah, blah. So it's a very long process. You see how many steps the process involves. And in Oshinsky's case, it's just a thin film. And it basically does, this, does the same. So Oshinsky was expecting that this will cause a boom and people will be interested. But instead, and this is Helmut Fritsche, one of the closest friends of, of, of Shinsky and the former head of Department of Physics in Chicago University. He was basically saying that Stan's discovery was contemptuously dismissed and attacked by mainstream physicists. And since his enemies were from the established research institution, they were able to block all federal research support. So the start of phase change materials was very complicated. And actually, even the paper, so he published a paper in his rev letters. He got two reviews, and both reviews were negative, very strongly negative. And then the editor decided to publish the paper anyway. So I don't think we have such editors now, usually. <laughs> the record is saying, no, it's no. But anyway, so this was the switching effect. But some other composition would show a memory effect. So when you apply an electrical field, the film of a certain chalcogenide material, it switches from the high resistance state to the low resistance state. And then when the field is removed, the material stays in this field. So it's a memory effect. And this memory effect has been commercialized in optical discs like CD, DVD, Blu-ray discs is the same principle and the same, essentially the same material. And about five years ago, Micron and Intel announced a new concept for electronic memory 2D cross point obtain. And now most computers have this obtained memory there. Then in 1987, Alek Pankratov predicted time reversal symmetry protected two dimensional edge states, which is exactly what topological insulators have. But this work is essentially unknown, so I found it. And this is a reference below, but usually it's a different paper which is cited, I will mention it later. And then rather recently after the discovery of graphene, there's been an increased interest for two dimensional chalcogenides. So it's again chalcogenides with materials like molybdenum sulfide, molybdenum cellarite, tungsten sulfide, tungsten tellurides. Well, these are a couple of books that I wrote on this topic. And now we'll go to the materials themselves, different classes of materials. So the first class is the chalcogenide glasses. So chalcogenide glasses is a glasses containing sulfur selenium. Well, tellurium as well, but tellurium usually is a very poor glass form. So if we're talking about good glasses, it's sulfides and selenides generally. So these materials are characterized by rather unusual electronic structure. It's two S electrons and four P electrons. So these four P electrons, they are distributed in such a way, there's one electron PX, one on PY, and two electrons on PZ. So PX and PY electrons are involved to form covalent bonds. And Z electrons, they basically remain. They don't participate in chemical bonding. And this has a drastic effect on the properties of the materials. If we talk about the conventional chalcogenides such as silicon, so there are S states and P states, SP3 hybridization. There are four bonding states and four anti-bonding states. And if we optically excite the material, we basically move an electron from the bonding state to the anti-bonding state. So we can say that we weaken some bonds or we break some bonds during the excitation process. But if we talk about chalcogenides, and basically, basically a special temperature proposed for the lone pair semiconductors, then the top of the valent bands is formed by lone pair electrons, that is material bonds that are, do not, are not involved in bonding. So we can excite them, 
but we don't weaken any bonds. But we excite them, we create unpaired electrons, and something interesting can happen in the material. Um, for example, for example, photostructural changes. So the effect was first observed in the early 70s. Again, Obshinsky here is one of the authors. And the effect is called what was named photodacum. Basically, if we look, take a transmission, this is absorption spectrum of arsenic sulfide. And if we illuminate it with light, then the absorption edge shifts to lower energy. So it's photodacum of the material. And then if we anneal the material close to the glass transition temperature, the initial properties are recovered. So if we start with the S prepared field, so this process is incomplete, but in all subsequent cycles, the transmission can be cycled between the red curves and the blue curves. So it's a photostructural change. Um, so the, am I right that uh, it's about uh, 1.05 uh, splitting is uh, just the splitting between uh, Px and uh, Py, this sigma plus, sigma minus on the previous slide splitting? Uh, yeah, this, no, uh, yeah, yeah, between sigma and sigma star. Between mm -hmm. sigma and sigma star, well, between the, the, the band gap in sulfide is about 2 EV. Yes. So from long pairs to sigma star is about 2 EV. Oh, I, I guess we should meant in the next slide, there is a shift in the absorption edge, yes. the energy shift, and yes. does it correspond to any no. of the... No. 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 So it's uh, some arbitrary value. It's an arbitrary value. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and, uh, sorry, one question again. That slide. Uh, does it uh, uh, so? Do you need any specific uh, 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 photo excitation for this structural change, or is it the, just the, any? The photon energy should be around the energy of the band gap. Yeah. Just you need absorption. That's all. Just you need absorption. Nothing fancy. It is high above, well above the absorption edge. The photodacking is weaker. It's not exactly clear why. Either it's really weaker or light absorbs in a very thin layer and doesn't penetrate the complete film, which will result in a smaller shift of the edge. Otherwise, if you decrease the energy, it's roughly proportional to the absorption coefficient. So basically you need absorption. Mm -hmm. So there are various speculations about the mechanism. At one point we did exaps measurements the exaps, I will not talk about the details. It's a, it's a structural method with which you can look at the local structure of crystalline materials and also amorphous materials. And basically, we concluded that what, what is happening is that optically we excite one of the electrons from the top of the valence band to the conduction band. We create an unpaired electron. And this unpaired electron can interact with lone pair of the neighboring chain and we can create a bond between the chains. And if you compare the energies of these two states, you can clearly see that this energy is lower. So the process is energetically favorable. But now when the excitation is turned off, so these electrons, they want to recombine, but they cannot recombine in this geometry because there are no empty states. In this geometry, there's empty state, long pair state. But once you form the third bond, long pair states disappear. And there are no empty states. So bond breaking has to take place for the recombination. If we can just break the newly created bond, this is not very interesting. Or we can create some other bond. And we create a three-fold coordinated selenium atom and two-fold co uh, single coordinated selenium atom. And the concentration of these centers can be quite high. So this was also confirmed we did what induced ESR. I don't have the slides here, or maybe I do, but they were just turned off. So we can clearly see different ESR signals associated with three-fold coordinated defects and chain ends. So for the reversible photodacony, reversible photostructural change, this is one effect. Another effect is reversible photo induced anisotropy. So if the sample is illuminated with linearly polarized light, we can create Anisotropy, so this is, oops, oops, anisotropy is here, yes. 
I parallel to I perpendicular divided to the square. And this anisotropy can be erased if we change the polarization of the light either to circular polarized or non polarized. So we can induce anisotropy, we can, it can be erased, induced, erased. Or it can be reversed if we change the polarization of the light to the orthogonal. So we can, uh, at which show frequency uh, this anisotropy take, takes place? At which? Yeah, uh, near the band gap. Band gap, the band gap. Right at the band gap. Or it's slightly lower. Or it's some kind of axitonic uh, state. Well, it's difficult. Uh, well, well, we talk, they do speak about self-trapped exciton in glasses, but basically the exitons is more crystalline, a, crystal, a crystalline thing. But it typically, to, see, to observe this effect properly, so this is done on a bulk glass, yeah. not on a thin film. Now, for the bulk glass, for the light to go through, let's say, a couple of millimeters, the absorption should not be very strong. So the light is slightly above the band gap. Very nice, yeah. So if it's actually sulfide, so it's probably about two EV. So red light. This, uh, this I think, was done with red light on arsenic sulfide. And arsenic sulfide has a bandwidth of about 2.1 to 2.2. Yeah, uh, because uh, you tell us about such a marvelous uh, things. So everything can happen. <laughs> so I can imagine exitone in uh, such a structure. And uh, so, so I just ask. Well, well, people do call these things three coordinated and chain end, they call C3 plus C1 minus defects. But sometimes people do call them self-trapped exitons. Yeah, I see. But the ones, I mean, for me, exitons is more it's, uh, crystalline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, uh, why, why the dynamics is so slow? It seems like it happens on a scale of minutes. It, it's slow. It's, it's a slow process. It's Photo, a thermal process. Photo darkening is slow. Not just that it's done at room temperature and atoms have to move and it's, it's a slow, it's minutes. So this, it's minutes. And this, by the way, is for the darkening, this curve. So you see, you can switch anisotropy, but the photo darkening continues to change in a monotonic way. So they are, processes, they are related somehow, but they're not exactly the same. Okay, if there are questions, we can talk about this in more detail, but now I switch to a deep second class of material because I guess I have one hour and like there was a joke, a husband and saying to his wife, you have 20 minutes and not a single hour more. Ah, okay, okay. 20 minutes and not a little less. Not a little less. So I will also try to fit into one hour. So it's phase change materials. And I think phase change materials, people here are more familiar with phase change materials. Uh, oh, sorry, it's phase change in, in chalcogenite glasses. It's a difficult, uh, before we go to phase change materials. There's a very special glass called arsenic 50 selenium 50 composition. And it's interesting in the sense that when you prepare a film, it's amorphous as deposited film. If you anneal the film, it crystallizes. This is not really surprising because annealing should cause crystallization. But then if you eliminate this film, it becomes amorphous again. And in this experiment, the film was illuminated by the light of a slight projector. Well, it could be heated by five degrees, 10 degrees, but of course, no melting, quenching, nothing like this was happening. So it's a purely optical process. Uh, the lights, 50-50, uh, not 1-1 uh, uh, one, one and, and um, such a why, why is 50 large numbers. No, in glasses, usually the indices are in such a way that the total should be 100. It's perfect. Okay, it's in, in a sense, it's percentage, but because in, in a crystal can be one, 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 two, sure, sure, sure. two, three, but the glass can be 55, 45. It's a convention. For, for glasses, it's, it's like this because glass essentially can have any composition. Yeah. So this is X ray diffraction and this is Raman scattering. So there's a Raman spectrum of the crystalline phase, a very narrow peaks, and many of them, which are characteristic feature of molecular crystal and the weak, broad peak characteristic of a 3D amorphous solid. So basically what's happening is that upon heating, the material crystallizes and forms these crystalline phases like balls of S4, SE4, 
held together by weaker and the Ralph's forces. And then upon an elimination, these Van der Waals bonds break and the 3D phases form. Why? It has not been studied any further. Another phenomenon is photocrystallization of Chilcogenic glasses. And in particular, it was studied for selenium. So if you have a selenium film, if you illuminate it with light, it crystallizes. And at one point, people saw that this is a thermal process because selenium crystallizes at temperature, slightly above room temperature. So with light, you can heat the material. It will crystallize, but it's not, not really so. So what is shown here are Raman spectra. So here, the panel A, the lowest spectrum is the spectrum of the amorphous phase. And when we eliminate the light gradually, another peak grows up and this peak corresponds to the crystalline phase. And after 30 minutes, you see that the peak intensity is nearly equal. Now we can eliminate exactly the same spot additionally with a green laser. And now if the polarization of the two lasers are parallel, you need like 50 minutes, probably a little bit more to have the two intensities equal. But if the two polarizations are orthogonal, you get the results in five minutes. So very clearly, this is not a thermal effect because the thermal energy pumped in this case and in this case is exactly the same, but the speed of crystallization differs by a factor of 10. Photoinduced fluidity in chalcogenite glasses. When the material is illuminated, its fluidity increases. And this was done on a flake of arsenic sulfide. So the upper panel shows the schematics of the experiment and the lower panel shows the real flake. So the flake is illuminated and it's pushed slightly at one end. And it just bends at the point where light was passing through. And again, this is not a thermal effect because the thermal dependence of the viscosity in the dark and under illumination have just opposite dependencies. So again, it's an optical effect. And it has found some very interesting application to fabricate some optical devices like, well, with etching, you can etch some structures, diffraction gratings. Well, this is probably just a, a toy. And there are numerous applications of Chalcogenic glasses in photonics. There are a couple of reviews in Nature Photonics. So you can fabricate wave guides. You can make holographic gratings. You can tune the quantum cascade lasers. You can make high Q cavities in two-dimensional Chalcogenic photonics. You can locally tune the photonic crystal cavities using Chalcogenic glass. And this example illustrates tuning a, a photonic crystal. So you have a photonic crystal with a thin film of chalcogenic glass on top. And when you illuminate the glass, its optical parameters change and the frequency, characteristic frequency of the crystal changes. I have a question about this. So uh, as I understood generally for these glasses, the transition speed is very low and can it be uh, speed sped up? I guess somehow because maybe at elevated temperatures, overall elevated well, temperature. Well, at elevated temperature, well, it will not be speed sped up to picoseconds or microseconds. It can become a few seconds rather than a few minutes. But also the degree of darkening is lower because if you increase the temperature, the, you erase the written information. So you can't really make it much faster. But in a sense, this is slightly similar to what you were doing with, with David Wright. When you had a phase change material, you were changing its parameters and you were changing the, the, the characteristic peaks. And there's another nature photonics paper about various devices using chalcogenic glass in combination with graphene. Okay, phase change materials. So phase change materials, so they're widely studied thanks to Stan Obshinsky, actually a fascinating person. I 
Well, one hour is not enough to talk about him. But basically his idea was that when the material is in the crystal and in the ordered state and in the disordered state, the structure changes and the properties can also change. So as is illustrated here, and the order state is called the set state and the disordered state is called the reset state. And the properties are different. Optical properties, electronic, pro electrical properties. Well, actually this is, I, I visited Opshinsky several times, so this is at his home. And what is happening in phase change material? So everybody knows phase change material. Should, can I skip this? Well, maybe not so everyone in the, in the well, 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 uh, just yeah, in, 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 in the online audience. Okay, so, so imagine you have a melt, and if you cool it down very slowly, the atoms can follow the changes in temperature, and eventually the material will crystallize. But if you cool it rapidly, at some point the viscosity becomes very high, the atoms can no longer adjust after the temperature changes, and we freeze the structure. So we get the overcooled liquid and then a glass. Or we can start with the glass, we can heat it up to the crystallization temperature, it will crystallize. So we can cycle the material between crystalline and amorphous phases. And in devices, of course, this is done with either optical pulse that heats the material, although optical component is also important, in, especially for shorter pulses, or it's a dual heating through short electrical pulses. You can switch the material between crystalline and amorphous phases, and it is widely used in optical discs from CD to Blu-ray. It's essentially there the same is, material. I guess there is a question from the audience, Ivan. Yeah, thank you, Ivan. Uh, I, I have a very general question. Uh, so what defines the path to which uh, the material uh, crystallizes after it's heated? So uh, amorphous or, or silicon. So as far as I understand, we melt the structure and then it, it has two ways either to cool down to amorphous or to silicon phase. Or, and I just, could, could you comment on uh, how, how it defines to which way to cool down? Well, if, you, if the material is cooled down fast enough, you will quench the amorphous phase. What is fast enough depends on the material. Let's say for arsenic sulfide, I was talking about it previously, you can have the melt in the furnace, you turn the furnace off, it cools down within 20 hours and you have a very nice glass. In phase change materials, you have to cool down with the speed like 10 to the six degrees per second in order to have the, obtain the amorphous phase. So it depends on the material. But, but how, how it comes that it becomes reversible? So you, you, just, uh, you just have the identical pulses and then you can uh, switch off and on the different phases, but how it comes that it goes from one side to another, uh, or like in a, in a controlled fashion, or the pulses should be different? No, no, the pulse to go between crystalline and amorphous phases, of course, they should be different. The pulse that makes the material amorphous should be very intense and very short. So you melt the material and it's rapidly quenched. The pulse that crystallizes the material should be lower in intensity, so it only heats the material to the crystallization temperature, and it should be longer. It should keep the material at this temperature for the time necessary for the crystallization. Yeah, thank you. Thank okay. You. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, I misunderstood the question at the beginning. But oh, so it seems that any material should do this thing, but to be used in memory, the material has to possess some specific properties. For example, there should be a, a large property contrast between the crystalline and amorphous phases. Otherwise, you won't be able to distinguish between them. Then there should be fast switching in both directions. And then both phases should be stable. And actually, the second and third requirements are, in a sense, contradictory. Because for fast switching, you basically want a low barrier between the states. For the stability of the material, you need a high barrier between the states. And of course, the material has to be switched many times. Well, like million times in order to have a commercial memory. It should be technological and should be cheap. For the property contrast, this slide show compares to material. On the left, there's a non-phase change material. 
On the right, there's a phase change material. And the blue and red curves correspond to amorphous and crystalline phases. So you see there's almost no difference for the conventional material. And there's a huge contrast for the phase change material. So there's something specific about these class of materials. And what it is, we'll know later. OK, and after years of research, Panasonic, under the leadership of Yamada, found the best material is germanium antimony telluride alloys. In the first papers, it was believed that basically we just go from the crystalline phase to the amorphous phase, but generally the local structure is very similar in the crystalline and amorphous phases. If we talk about amorphous silicon and crystalline silicon, amorphous arsenic sulfide, crystalline arsenic sulfide, the structure is similar. But it's not the case for the phase change materials. So like almost 20 years ago now, we did an EXAPS material it's experiment on amorphous films and on crystalline film. And again, I won't go into the details of EXAPS. It's a spectroscopic method that needs synchrotron radiation that allows you to study the structure. And what is shown here for year transformed spectra of the crystalline and amorphous material. And in a sense, it's similar to the radial distribution function. It's not the same, but there is some similarity. And now if you look here, the peak for the amorphous phase is stronger, narrower, and it's shifted to shorter distances, which is very unusual if we are talking about just disordering of covalent bonds. Because in the disordered phase, you should have a broad distribution. The peak should be broader, lower in intensity. And because of non-harmonicity, unharmonicity, the peak bond lengths in the amorphous materials are usually longer. So something very unusual is happening in this material. And at that moment, we propose that there's a kind of umbrella flip when germanium atoms switches between octahedral and tetrahedral sites within tellurium FCC sublattice. Uh, can you comment why is, I, 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 every time I wonder why it's umbrella uh, flip? Uh, Forget it. It's probably not true. It was the, the, the idea. I mean, we, we could fit the EXAPS data with the germanium atoms in the octahedral and tetrahedral sites in the structure. So the first thing, of course, it probably just flips between these states. Yeah. It probably doesn't flip. But it does go between tetrahedral and, and, and octahedral, see, but in a different way, I will mention this later. But why umbrella? Uh, uh, why umbrella? No, you have an umbrella under the rain, and imagine strong wind, and then... Oh, I see, I see. It, it's kind of... Under the wind. Yes. Because so, I see it. <laughs> no, 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 your no. umbrella flip is... Okay, I see. So why are phase change materials spe special? So from diffraction measurements, it was found that antimony telluride and GST alloys have rock salt-like structure with tellurium making one FCC lattice and germanium and antimony forming the other FCC lattice. And here comes the question, how can each atom make four bonds, six bonds, six bonds here? Because the number of electrons is certainly not sufficient. And to understand this, let's look at how a covalent bond is formed first. So this is the diagram how we form a hydrogen molecule. We move two atoms together. And then depending on the symmetry of the wave function, we can form under the bonding state or we can form the anti-bonding state. Now, so, so we can basically imagine the germanium and tellurium just form pairs. They're, they're bonded in pairs, but then there are these back lobes which don't interact if it's minus plus. Well, minus plus corresponds to different symmetry. It's not minus, it's not plus, it's just symmetry, different symmetry of the wave function. But if it's plus plus here to form a strong bond here, then it's minus minus between this pair of atoms. And plus plus or minus minus, it doesn't really matter. So the bond can be formed between this pair of atoms. And here it's a weak interaction. So there, there was a name called resonant bond. Uh, originally it was suggested by Lukowski 
many, many years ago. And then Woody published a paper where he reinvented resonant bonds. And now he's calling them metavalent bonds. If you follow the literature, you know all this terminology. But to form these bonds, weaker bonds between these atoms, it's important that the at all atoms, they should be lined up. They should be in one straight line. Because for the strong interaction, it doesn't matter. It's a covalent bond, a direction and bond, whatever it is, it's a strong bond. But for the weaker bond to be formed, they have to be aligned because if they are not aligned, they don't look at each other, they don't, they don't, they don't interact. Like, and now imagine with sort of some strong thermal excitation atom starts to move. And if this, let me call the dipoles, these strongly bonded germanium and tellurium, if they vibrate like this, there's almost no effect on the resonant bond. But if they move like this, then resonance bonding will be broken. And what is happening? Let's look at how this is happening in the material. So this is the structure of real sodium chloride, ionic material, and it was distorted in a certain way, distorted manually, atoms were just moved manually slightly to the, sort of disorder the material in such a way that to break the resonant interaction, if it were resonant. But if it's pure sodium chloride, if we let the structure re relax, it just goes back to the crystalline structure, which is not unusual. It's ionic interaction. It only depends on the distance between the atoms. And of course, the atoms go to the equilibrium positions. But we have germanium telluride distorted in exactly the same way. And if we let this structure relax, it becomes disordered. So once we break the resonant interaction, there's no force that would bring the structure back. There's another interesting thing about this resonant bonding. If you look, so this is how schematically this process may happen, but now if you look at the perfect crystal, and these are N and K, optical constants of the material, so you see this value here corresponds to roughly five. Now we break resonant interaction, but if you look at the atomic structure, it still looks very much cubic. Well, cubic or rectangular in 2D, but the optical constant it drops from five to four. And now when the structure becomes completely amorphous, disordered, the optical properties do not change. It's four, which means that the optical contrast is not determined by sort of ordered or disordered structure, but whether there is or that there's no resonant interaction. Once we break the resonant interaction, we change the optical contrast. Sorry, the question about this. So uh, in the modeling, if you start with the ideal crystalline structure mm -hmm. and introduce some, I don't know, thermal fluctuations, does it still break? So what is the threshold here? Did you try to evaluate the threshold on, of this uh, displacement that will trigger the amortization? Well, well, if we really want to do this thermally, it will be thermal melting. So we can just melt the structure. Yes, so the idea was just to model the rupture of resonant interaction. But I will show you another slide a little bit later, and maybe this will answer the question. Now, what is the role of electronic excitation? Because previously I was telling you that short pulse heats the material to a higher temperature or to a lower temperature. Okay. So there are several papers looking at the role of electronic excitation. We studied how the electron density changes in germanium telluride, which is a endpoint material for phase change alloys. And what is shown here, so there are germanium atoms, tellurium atoms, and what is shown here in red, this is the charge density difference. So this is the difference between the electronic density of atoms in a solid compared to density in the same structure, assuming non-interacting atoms. So basically how electron density changes when atoms start to interact. 
an increased density you're of just, the covalent bond. I'm, I'm aware that you just used uh, uh, atomic orbitals of a uh, uh, single atom and place it here and... Uh, no, it's not atomic orbital. This was sort of called DFT, density, density functional CR simulation of, of electron density. But, but, but this, this, this is a difference between... Well, I, I understand that uh, the first one is uh, the actual density for the uh, solid state. Yes. And uh, the difference with what? If it's not the not, not non -interact pair. not interacting atoms. Well, the software knows how to do it. Let me answer it like this. Okay. Uh, as, uh, can I imagine that uh, it is um, just standalone atoms? Yes, in principle. And yes. Uh, you push it to the proper position yes. of the crystal lattice. Yes. Okay, I see. And so the increased density between two atoms is a signature covalent bond. We increase electron density between the atoms. Yes, and uh, the red is uh, increased density and uh, blue is. Red is increased density. Yeah, and blue is probably a decrease in density. Yes, a lot of a logical conclusion. And then we transfer a certain number of electrons from the valence band to the conduction band. And we calculate the same thing. And you see that with 5% excitation, the electron distribution significantly changes. So electro electronic excitation has a, diff a strong effect on the electron dis distribution of electron density in the material. There was also another paper, actually this person, Shen Bai Zhang, he is working a lot on phase change materials. So they also found that the potential, adiabatic potential in the ground state and in the excited state changes when you go from the non-excited state to the excited state. And this is an interesting paper about GST, role of electronic excitation in the amorphization alloys. So in their case, so they were exciting the material, transferring a certain number of electrons to the conduction band and looking how the structure will evolve. So this is 0 0.5 picoseconds and blah, 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 and 24 picoseconds. So it starts with the ordered material and it starts to be disordered and eventually it's completely disordered. And in this slide here, they show the pair correlation function for different stages of photoexcited change in the structure. And the red curve is the radial distribution function of the melt, thermal melt. And you see that the melt is drastically different from all other plots corresponding to the optically excited state. So again, this process is not thermal excitation, it's something else that is happening. And also this is the mean square displacement for germanium atoms in the excited, for the optically excited states, the atoms actually doesn't move much. They just slightly readjust their position. In the melt, they do diffuse. There's a large mean square, square displacement. So there's a, electronic excitation does play a role. But most likely it plays a role for very short excitation, like picoseconds, maybe probably femtoseconds. In conventional switching that takes nanoseconds, maybe the thermal effects dominate. Well, this is just another plot for the, this implementation of memory by Intel and Micron. So now they're making this memory that occupies the place between the storage and CPU. Current and future development. One interesting development is the so-called interfacial phase change materials. The idea belongs to my colleague Tominaga, who basically thought, based on the umbrella flip model, that germanium can flip in various directions from the center. So there are some a lot of entropy involved in the process. So he thought, what happens if we spatially separate antimony telluride and germanium telluride. Antimony telluride has a layered structure like this. Germanium telluride has shorter and longer bonds. So it's a quasi-layered structure. And these two materials have very similar lattice constants. So you, we can make a super lattice between antimony telluride and germanium telluride. 
and this should reduce the entropic losses and the material should work better. And it does indeed work better. So the paper was published in nanotechnology, Nature Nanotechnology and there's a lot of work. Now there's a, there was a very big pastry, European pastry project, a few million dollars. And now there's another project just finishing, which is called on hand basing. So there's a lot of work going with this interfacial phase change memory. Then phase change materials are interesting materials for neuromorphic computing because you can not only change the material in a binary way from amorphous to crystalline, but you can have multi-level recording, a kind of analog, analog recording, which is interesting for neuromorphic synapses that IBM is working. Actually, there are quite a few, a lot of work done in IBM for use of Germanium GST and chips with phase chain devices for neuromorphic computing. Okay, this is multi level recording. And some optical applications. So, this is the way by David Wright, whom everyone knows very well. So, he was trying to make some displays, how we're changing the color and the thickness. You can obtain different colors. You can write diffraction gratings with light, make ripples in the material. And then the period of the ripples actually depends on the, and the direction of the ripples depends on the wavelengths of the light. They can be either parallel to the polarization of the light or perpendicular to the polarization of the light. And they can be rewritten from one polarization to the other polarization and well, this was done by Pavel Trapima and, and, yeah, and the organizer of the seminar. And this is an, uh, another way to apply this material would be in some reconfigurable metasurfaces. So there's a lot of interest in metasurfaces, but if you look, use conventional materials, then once you make the metasurface, well, it has certain properties that they can't be changed. But if you make these metasurfaces from phase change materials, you can change the phase of the material, you can heal the properties of the metasurface. If you make this material from the pure phase change material, there should be enough of it to have the needed contrast, then it's more difficult to quench it properly and blah, 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 and there are many problems. So, Ivan and David, I don't know who of them, came up with a very elegant idea to combine GST with silicon. So they made these hybrid structures. And so this is silicon oxide and silicon, the combination of GST and pure GST and the combination of silicon and GST. So the pure silicon, of course, the two resonances, they are just fixed, they are determined by the material. If it's pure phase change material, there is a difference, but the difference is not, well, as big as in the case of the hybrid structure, where you see this resonance can be either completely suppressed or can be made, made very strong. And what is important, it can be, moved in a gradual analogous way. So multi-level recording. So there are like eight levels of recording. So it's a, basically a step on the way to neuromorphic optical systems. So there, there will be a big conference on these materials in Oxford in September. Well, the deadline has passed, but if some of you are really interested, maybe you can contact the organizers and send something there. Ten minutes left, so yeah, what, we, we can extend a bit, but we, maybe we can extend a bit. Okay, then then I will will basically just I, I will skip some of the slides here, so we can extend maybe five ten minutes, not more, yeah. not more. So topological insulators. Well, there's a lot of interest in topological insulators these days, and basically this is a very interesting example when materials were predicted theoretically first, and then they were discovered experimentally. Usually experiment goes first, and then theory steps in to explain the experiment. 
In this case, topological insulators were predicted theoretically and and then and, and, and. there is some analogy between topological insulator and quantum hall effect in the sense that if you have a film, a conducting film, you apply a very strong magnetic field, then at the center, the, the, the magnetic forces, so Lorentz forces, so strong that they actually orbits form closed circles, but at the edge, electron can move freely and there's no scattering. And this was called, called mathematically like two equals one plus one. So two, there are two directions for electrons to go, but if it goes one way on the upper surface and it goes back on the lower surface. And if there's an impurity, the electron cannot be scattered because to scatter it means it has to go back and to go back, it has to be at the lower surface and there's a large distance to tunnel. So basically scattering is forbidden. And with analogy to two equals one plus one, a constant of four equals two plus two was introduced. And in this case, spin was taken into account. And spin orbit interaction plays the role of the magnetic field. And now the spin up electrons go like this, let's say clockwise, and spin down electrons goes counterclockwise. So there's no car charge current, but there are two spin currents in the material. <coughs> and there's a lot of research in, this, in these materials. Now, again, there's, there can be no scattering. This is the paper when the first topological insulator was experimentally observed. And you see it was published in Science in 2007, exactly 20 years after the paper by Pankratov, who predicted exactly the same result for exactly the same materials just 20 years earlier. But probably he was too much ahead of time and the paper was not appreciated at that time. What's happening in the material with these topological things? When we form a solid, so usually there are P states and S states, and when atomic orbitals remove atoms closer, we form a solid, then the valence band is formed with P of states and conduction band is formed with S states. But if there is very strong spin orbit coupling, these can be reversed. So S states can be at the conduction band and P states can be in the S states in the valence bands and P like states in the conduction band. So this change in the position of S states and P states, topological states, causes the formation of this Dirac cone, which allows for dissipation less transport. It can be used like in transistors, in Majorana fermions, quantum computing. But so far, I think there's more, more hype the actual results in topological insulators, but the idea is very interesting. Hopefully with a lot of weapons, something will come out of it. The materials that, where we, do we have to look for the materials, materials for topological insulators? On the one hand, the band gap has to be small in order for spin orbit coupling to reverse the bands. On the other hand, the band gap has to be rather large. Because if the band gap is very small, there will be thermal excitation across the gap and we'll have a lot of bulk charge carriers. To really utilize the topological properties, we should have the material with only surface states, with no carriers in the bulk. So this is an intrinsic problem because the gap has to be small from one perspective, it should be large from another perspective. And where to look for topological insulators? Strong spin orbit coupling, we need heavy elements like antimony or tellurium. And we also need good surfaces because if we take a conventional 3D surface, if we cleave the material, there are dangling bonds, bond reconstruction, the structure of the material may change and it may affect the, the electronic state. So, what is actually the surface defects? 
mm. which are gr great uh, to be protected for the topologically protected H states? Well, it, it, it depends. It depends. So some defects don't have any effects. Other defects may have an effect. So it's much better to have clean surfaces, and such clean surfaces exist in Van der Waals solids. And these good Van der Waals solids are layered chalcogenic, such as antimony telluride, bismuth telluride, bismuth selenide, and in all these materials, topological states have been absor absorbed experimentally. Uh, so, am I right that uh, it's a challenge to find a proper uh, topological, uh, a proper surface defect uh, that allow, uh, that uh, can protect topologically protected uh, currents. Well, the defects such uh, well, time is limited. But for example, even for antimony telluride, which is the classic topological insulator for Van der Waals surfaces. We clearly see direct cones in the density of in the electronic structure, but if we cut the material, make the same slice differently, like perpendicular to the to the layers, there's no no direct cone. It disappears. So we do have metallic states, but we don't have the direct cone. It's because uh, we are either at uh, the gamma k directions. Uh, or in other directions? I'm not sure if it's actually important with the direction. It's, it, it's just a di different topology. Uh, I mean that uh, the record has uh, its own location at the reciprocal space, and uh, the electronic transport uh, uh, has to, have to match the direction. Otherwise, uh, there is a band gap. In other direction. Right, but in some cases the, the, the direct cone just disappears, it's not formed. Oh, I see. It's not formed. Okay, and now there are some papers where people try to find analogs in photonics. So there are papers like photonic topological insulators, topological photonics. So maybe sometime later we'll talk on this as well. And two digital cogenites. So, okay. It's Let's say 10 minutes. Ten, 10 minutes. Okay, 10 minutes. Well, the, why are 3D semiconductors not good? Why was this, this interest in 2D semiconductors? If you have a 3D material, you have bonds going in all directions. If you cleave the surface, you will always have dangling bonds. There will be surface reconstruction, the properties you don't know what you get. It may be beneficial, it may not. So, this is one issue. Another thing, let's say you want to grow a super lattice, like germanium on silicon. But if you grow one material on another, and if the lattice constants are different, the material does not grow in the layer by layer mode. It grows in the so called Stransky Krastanov mode when islands are formed instead of continuous layers. More than this, if so at one point I was doing a lot of spectroscopy for germanium grown on silicon. So there are a couple of examples. And these are Zane spectra of germanium grown on silicon, on oxidized silicon and epitaxial grows. Zanes, again, let's look at it. It's a spectroscopic method. Look at it just as a fingerprint of the material, of the structure. So if we grow germanium on oxidized silicon, so there's an oxide layer, and germanium goes on top, then this spectrum of bulk germanium and the spectrum of non germanium grown on silicon, non epitaxia, they are the same. So basically, we do grow germanium on silicon oxide. But if we try to grow germanium on silicon, and in this particular case, there was another silicon layer on top. So germanium was sandwiched between two silicons. So as you see, the spectrum is totally different. From the spectrum of germanium. And it's very similar to the spectrum of a solid solution germanium in silicon. Because of strain, strong diffusion takes place, and it's just impossible to form the super lattice. So when people form super lattice like gallium arsenide, aluminium gallium arsenide, very few combinations are possible, others are impossible. But if you have a 2D materials, with weak Van der Waals interaction, you can combine basically anything. So this is 
this one driving force. And the interest actually arose after Andre Gaiman. Konstantin, and he called him Hel Kostya, God. So why is this interest? So one reason is ultimately low power consumption. If you have a bulk semiconductor, imagine the thickness of the active layer is a micron. In the 2D material, the thickness of the active layer is an angstrom, a few angstroms. Of course, you need significantly less energy, let's say, to drive this, the same current density. Then thin layers are transparent, so it's transparent electronic, it's flexible electronics, so it's very exciting in your physics. Example of flexible electronics, and example how you can make different heterostructures because a very weak when there was interaction, you can put different materials, you can rotate one material with respect to another, so-called moire. Let us understand that there's some work on moire to the materials going on here. And there's one paper which is called the supermaterial that could trump graphene. Who knows? So this is the structure of the, one of the better known 2D semiconductors, transition metal dichel cogenate, molybdenum sulfide. There's molybdenum inside, it's kept by sulfur. And these layers are kept together by weak van der Waals interactions. And the structure of the layer itself can be either trigonal prismatic or octahedral, the structure of the local surrounding of the metal inside the layer. And trigonal prismatic is usually a semiconductor and octahedral stru structure is usually a metal. And the interest started from the, basically not so long ago, like just 10 years ago, 12 years ago, with the discovery of very strong photoluminescence in monolayer molybdenum sulfide. So this picture shows photoluminescence in bilayer and monolayer. In bilayer, there's no more photoluminescence and strong signal in monolayer. And it was shown that the material is a non-direct gap semiconducting material in the bulk form, and it becomes a direct gap material in the monolayer limit. And this caused a boom in, in these materials. And they can be used for strain tronics, we can use tune the band gap by strain. There's very large exciton binding energy. Now it's a crystal, so we can talk about excitons. And the exciton energy is actually quite big, maybe 10, 10, 50 times larger than in conventional materials, which is very important for electronic applications. Now there are very interesting spin properties. Like for example, if you have a bilayer, then spin is up in one layer, it's down in another layer, and you can play with these. And there are demonstration of various applications of the materials like field effect transistor, laser here, well, and, and others, and I'll try to be very quick. So potentially we can switch the structure of the material between tetrahedral and an octahedral without breaking bonds, just sliding the atomic surfaces, so the process should be very fast. So we tried doing this with just see what would be the effect of optical excitation. And with optical excitation, we found that the excited state is metallic. So there's a fine density of states at the Fermi level. But when the excitation is turned off, the material goes back to the original state. So basically it's not a metastable state, it's the state that only lives when it is excited. But of course, it may help to go to the metastable 1T state with octahedral, with, with, with octahedral structure. Yes, so if you look at the energy, the barrier that we have to overcome for the ground state, and from this state, the barrier is lower, so the process should proceed more easily. And there are quite a few papers on septic a second and you displace a phase transition, controllable transition, laser and you septic a second la lattice symmetry switch. And most of these effects are taking place in molybdenum and ditellurite. In sulfide, there's a larger energy difference between the octahedral structure and trigonal prismatic structure. In molybdenum and tellurite, they're almost equal. So for this purpose, molybdenum and tellurite is usually used. And this class of material is constantly expanding. So there's a new material of like Indian selenite, 
gallium selenide. And again, if you look at the at the authors, both Nobel Prize winners are here, and they are trying to make semiconducting quantum wells using Van der Waals crystals. And again, these materials are chalcogen. So chalcogenides. It's a very important class of materials, and major semiconductor properties were discovered using chalcogenides. Chalcogenide glasses, they change the paradigm of the forbidden gap resulting from long range order. It's now clear that the band gap, the origin of the band gap in the chemical nature of bonding. So covalent materials usually form semiconductors. Phase change memory devices. Well, they are crucial to modern life. And from the pure science, a new type of chemical bond, this resonance and metavalence bonds were suggested. Topological insulate and new quantum state of matter also was mostly studied on chalcogenides. And to these semiconductors, this new rapidly developing class of materials is also chalcogenides. So chalcogenides are very important materials, and the richness of their properties is due to the presence of long pair electrons that can go in one way or another and build different structures. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting talk. So, uh, is there any questions from Zoom? If so, please. Yeah, may I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Feel so, uh, I, I, uh, I have a question regarding this uh, semiconductor to metal transition in uh, molybdenum detoluride. So, the, does it, uh, what is the plasma frequency of this metallic phase? So, is it like really a good metal or? Uh, it's something like uh, like doped semiconductor. Well, it's a good question, but I don't know the answer. So, so the conclusion it was the metal was in our work it was reached basically on on the density of states. We, we see mm -hmm. that it's not gapped. It's mm -hmm. gapped in the ground state. It becomes non-gapped in the photoexcited states. And there are some experimental work when people try to make contacts, for example, using these materials. For example, there's molybdenum sulfide, which is a semiconductor, but to make an ohmic contact, you need a, a good contact. So people use this molybdenum telluride in the metallic phase. So they mm -hmm. say it's metallic, but I'm not sure if, if basically a plasma frequency or anything like this has been studied. Okay. Uh, and well, so you mentioned that this is a metastable state. So what is uh, what is like general lifetime in at ambient conditions of this state, or is it like? Well, it's metastable in. A, oh, let me go back. Well, it's it's not metastable. Metastable states would so state would be this. Mm -hmm. So the state that is separated from the ground state by a barrier. Mm -hmm. Well, under photo excitation, but as I say, this is purely simulational work. So we, mm -hmm. we didn't look at this. The, oops. This excited state parabola is located inside the ground state parabola because when we turn off the light, it immediately goes back to the ground state. Ah, so okay, no I see. Separating them. Okay, yeah, yeah, I understand. Thank you. I uh, actually also have a question about this part. So, so you mentioned that for uh, tellurium, right? You uh, you see the, um, the the barrier is not very large, and the transition is from metal to semiconductor. Yes. What about sulfides? Even though sulfides or selenides, probably even though the maybe the barrier is higher and it it is much more difficult to perform this transition, but uh, do you expect the same uh, transition from metal metallic state to? Well, the transitions have been observed thermally. So, for example, if you heat up molybdenum sulfide, eventually go to the metallic phase. But I mean, optically, I, I don't know any papers. Optically, the papers I know all use molybdenum telluride. And so for the case of thermal switching, you also need just to maintain the elevated temperature. Yes. Or... yes. Do you think it is possible to, uh, well, no, I think the, I just thought that maybe there can be made some, some kind of different boundary between different domains of this 
of semiconductor and metallic states. Uh, within, this, within the same field. Yeah, but different you dimensions. get to the thermal, just thermal diffusion, I guess this is quite maybe tricky, right? So, and those uh, papers you mentioned that made the contacts, was it experimental work that made contacts? So how did they, they maintain that part? In, well, in the we, state? No, they had molybdenum sulfide as the channel material in the transistor, and the contacts were molybdenum telluride. Molybdenum telluride is stable in both. Mm -hmm. yes. So, any more questions from Zoom, from the audience? No? Okay, then let's thank the speaker.